Bibles tonight, and let's just open them, if you would, in the New Testament to the book of Mark chapter 10, the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, and I've been preaching a series of messages to you on Wednesday evening that we're calling Stories of Hope. And what we're doing is, is we're just looking at stories in the Word of God that involve Jesus, that offer hope. We know that we live in a world today that shouts at us that we have no hope, and you might be discouraged tonight, you might feel defeated, you might feel like you have no hope, but I promise you tonight that there is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a God of hope no matter what is going on in our life. And so what we've been doing, man, we've just been going through the Word of God and finding stories that encourage, stories that offer hope, and, and looking maybe at people that were in hopeless situations and just to see how the Lord Jesus Christ moved in their life and, gave, and give them hope. And so we're going to be looking at, at a very well-known story. Many of you maybe know it. Um, it's uh, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. I'm going to begin to read in verse 46. I'm preaching tonight on this subject. Stopping Jesus in his tracks. Stopping Jesus in his tracks. The Bible says in, in the book of Mark chapter 10 verse 46, it says, And they came to Jericho. Now, this is Jesus and his disciples. They came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more the great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still. He stopped in his tracks and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What will thou that I should do unto thee? In other words, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith have made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Amen? Father, we just come to you tonight, and, and Lord, we just know that, Father, you are in total control of what you want to do tonight. So, Lord, I'm just asking that I may preach under Holy Spirit unction and anointing. And God, I just pray that you will remove distractions. And I just pray, Lord, that I will preach your pure, holy word with power and with just what you would have me do tonight. So God, minister to our hearts. Everybody here tonight has got a need. Everybody's got something going on. And Lord, we know that your word brings life. So we pray that your truth, God, will resonate in our souls and breathe life into us. And for this, we ask for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, this is the very last miracle of healing that our Lord would actually perform before his Passion Week. Now, you have to understand here that he's on his way to Jerusalem. His destiny here is the cross. I mean, he, he has explained that carefully to his disciples. He told them in much detail really what was up ahead. I will be betrayed. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be mocked. They are going to nail me to a cross. I'm going to the city of Jerusalem to pay the sin debt for the human race. And along the way to pay our sin debt, along the way to, to actually bring about God's work of redemption of the slain Passover lamb, along the way to have an ordained, predetermined appointment with an old rugged cross, along the way, our Lord stopped to help a blind man. Nobody ever cared for me like Jesus. Never too busy to have, a, have time for the brokenhearted. Never too busy to have time for those that are suffering. Now, now somebody is, is here tonight, and you're thinking tonight that nobody else cares about you that the world is too busy, 
But I'm telling you, friend, that Jesus is not too busy. Now, now to me here, this is probably one of the most significant miracles in all the Bible. Well, one of the most significant, really, in all the Word of God. You say, well, Brother Danny, it doesn't seem as spectacular as the feeding of the 5,000. Well, that was spectacular to take that little lunch and feed 5,000 people. I mean, that was certainly spectacular. And then we read how Jesus walked on water, right? Like he was walking on pavement. I mean, that was a miracle. No two ways about it. But to me, in a very unique way, this is one of the most significant miracles in all the Bible. Why? Think about it. A mortal man said something that caused the Son of God to actually stop right in his tracks. A a mortal man said something here that caused the Son of God to be gripped in his heart and just to stop where he was going. The the Bible says in, in verse 49 that Jesus stood still. So what was it to get his attention, to stop him as he's on his way to a rugged cross? I mean, he's, he's not running errands here. He, he's not on his way to the grocery store. I mean, he, guys, think about this. He's, he's going here to Calvary. I, I mean, what is it that can grab a hold of the sovereign God of the universe and stop him right in his tracks? What, what, what was it that caused Jesus just to stop? Everything he was doing, what was it? It was faith. It was faith. The the Bible says, notice in verse 52, Jesus said unto him, go your way, your faith has made you whole. You, You see, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, this man teaches us something about the faith life. Something about just simple, uncomplicated, uncompromised, naked faith. That this is the one, that this is one of the supreme teachings of the Holy Bible. It's one of the supreme themes and subjects of the Word of God, the subject of faith. I mean, think about this, guys. The Bible says that's the way we begin our Christian life, does it not? The Bible says without faith, we cannot be saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The the Bible teaches us that the only way for a Christian to really live a life that's fruitful and meaningful and successful is we got to live by faith. I mean, we don't walk by sight. We don't walk by feeling. We don't walk by circumstances. We walk by faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, without faith, it's impossible for you to please God. Now, that's a tremendous statement. Listen, you you can try to do anything else you want to try to do in life, and you can try to do all these religious works, but without faith, it's impossible for you to please God. You you see, I, I see that here, that God is pleased with faith. He said, your faith has made you whole. Now, I just want to make some observations tonight about this faith life that that literally caused the Lord Jesus Christ to stop in his tracks. Now notice with me uh, uh, several things. Are you with me tonight? Say amen. Amen. Now notice with me, first of all, that the faith life, number one, is a life of needing. It is a life of needing. Folks, listen, there there can't be a miracle unless first there's a need. I mean, God doesn't move in and do the impossible unless there's something impossible to do. Now, now you're sitting here tonight and maybe you're depressed because you got a need. And understand, you might have a need, but understand that your need actually can be your greatest blessing. Now, now look at the need that this man had. The Bible says in verse 46, when they came to Jericho and and Jesus went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. Now, here's a man that is a blind man. Here's a man that's sitting beside the highway side begging. Now, this tells me three things about this man. First of all, it tells me that he was blind. I mean, this man could not see the light of the day. 
And now to understand, in those days, there was no Braille to learn. There was no school for the blind. There was no dogs that could be trained that could help you actually help you get through the city streets. I mean, there was none of the resources that's actually available today for people that are blind. So what a need. But not only was he blind, but the Bible says that he sat by the roadside begging. I mean, that was the only thing a blind person could do back in those days. In those days, if you were physically blind, you were actually doomed to a life of being a beggar, of just living off the crumbs that people would pitch in your lap. And so he's blind, and because he's blind, he's a beggar, and because he's a blind beggar, he is absolutely hopeless. Folks, he is a prime candidate for a miracle work from a sovereign Savior. He is a prime prospect prospect for a touch from, a, from the miracle-working power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to what I'm getting ready to say. You need to see your need as a nudge. Do you understand really what a nudge is? A, a, a nudge, now listen to this, a nudge is not a hit but, but it's, it's a nudge is really a little bit more than a touch, right? It's not a hit, but it's a little bit more than just a touch. And you know what God does? God allows certain things in our life to give us a gentle nudge to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, let me say something to you. Anything that's nudging you to Jesus is not your enemy. It is your friend. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I mean, needs are really blessings. I mean, if that blind man had never been blind, he would have never had the miracle of having his sight restored. If the people never had been hungry, that Jesus would have never had the opportunity of feeding the 5,000. So, so you sit here tonight hopeless like this man. Some kind of blindness in your life. Some kind of begging in your life. You think your situation's hopeless, but I'm telling you folks that the same Jesus that stopped and reached out to this man is the same Jesus that's in this building tonight. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And let me say this to you. He's not too busy to help you. Right? I mean, think about this, man. Think about how busy Jesus was. See, here you are tonight, you think you're busy. You're like, oh my goodness, I, I've just barely made it today. I'm just too busy. Well, bless your little heart, amen? Listen, you, you know that God's pretty busy too. Did you know that? I mean, I mean, he's, hey, he's got to keep busy keeping our lungs breathing. He's got to keep busy keeping our heart beating, you know? And yet he is in this building tonight, and he cares for you. And the very thing that you're griping about, you know what? You, you ought to just say, God, thank you for this need because I just realized that this need is really my nudge to get to you. You, you see, I don't think you really understand what a nudge is. Again, a nudge is more than a touch, but it's less than a hit. So you feel it, but it won't inflict much damage. You know, I'll give you an example. My wife and I were in the voting line yesterday, and, and I was kind of reading my phone, and, you know, people were getting ahead of me, and so my wife gave me a gentle nudge. She didn't push me in the back, thank the Lord, amen, but she just gave me a, a nudge. Danny, come on, we got to go. And, and so I'm like, oh, okay, and so it, it nudged me where I needed to go. That, that's really what a nudge is. It, it, listen, she wasn't pushing me. She was nudging me into the right direction. This is what I want you to think about. That, that's what your need is tonight. It's a gentle nudge that God brings about in your life to get you sometimes to go in the direction that he wants you to go. I mean, listen, always remember this. My need is my nudge. Your, your need is not your enemy. So the Holy Spirit, listen, the Holy Spirit is using the need to just nudge me to the only one who can meet my needs. Listen, guys, you wouldn't stay close to him if it wasn't for all those needs that came into your life. You wouldn't stay on your knees and be drawn to prayer and God if it wasn't for those needs that God has brought into your life. Why? Because he's nudging you to the Lord Jesus Christ. So your need is not necessarily your enemy. We, we think of our needs as an enemy and as a burden. But I, I want you to sort of change your perspective on that. 
I want you to start thinking about those needs that you got and those, those things that, you're, that, you're, that you feel is a tremendous need. Understand that, that God has brought it into your life because He's nudging you to Him. See, your need is not your enemy. And so we see here that the faith life is a life of needing. What is your need tonight? Recognize that. That's a, it's a nudge to draw you closer to the Lord. There's a second thing that we see here in, in this story. Not only do we see that the faith life is a life of needing, but the faith life is a life of hearing. It's a life of hearing. Now, notice what the Bible says down in verse 47. It says, And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. Now, now it, listen, it is significant here to notice what he cried out. Because after he heard some of the things about Jesus, he made a determination. The Bible says, notice, when he heard that it was Jesus coming down the road. Now, now understand this. This man never saw any miracles that Jesus performed. He never saw Jesus heal any of the blind people that we read about in the Bible that he healed. He, this man never actually saw Jesus take a little lunch and multiply the loaves and the fishes to feed all those people. I mean, thousands of people actually saw that. He, he never actually saw Jesus walk on the, on the water like the disciples did. He, he, listen, he never saw Jesus cleanse the leper and make him whole. But he heard about the leper being healed. He heard about Jesus walking on the water. He heard about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And the Bible says in verse 47 that he begins to cry out, Jesus. Now that's his name and his mission because Jesus in the Old Testament means Joshua, which means Jehovah saves. And let me just say this, that just may be what God's wanting to do in your life tonight. He's wanting you to cry out for Jehovah to save you. But notice here, he cried out and he said this, Jesus Thou son of David, and, and that means he's Messiah. That, that literally means he's the one that's promised in the Old Testament. He's not just a man, he's a holy God. He said, Jesus, listen, thou son of David, have mercy on me. See, he's not asking for what he deserves. He's asking knowing that our God is a God of love who delights in giving people what they do not deserve. He asked for mercy, a man with a need. Now, I said here that the faith life is a life of hearing. You, you see, guys, remember that, that faith is not seeing, then believing. No. When it's faith, listen, does faith come really by seeing? No. Does it come by feeling? No. It comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So faith is born when I simply will believe what I read and what I hear in the Word of God. That's why we got to be faithful to God's house. That's why we got to be here when these doors are open. Why? So I can hear what is prophesied and what is preached from the very living Word of God to be able to build my faith up. Because listen, man, it'll, it's going to make me stronger, right? It's going to make my faith get, get stronger. That, that's the way you live the life of faith. That, that's the way that you make Jesus Stand still, the life of faith. L let me just tell you tonight simply what faith is, okay? Faith is simply believing what God says is so because he says it so in his word, and he's the one who said it. And faith grabs a hold of what he says in the word of God. So, so this man sitting by the roadside has a lesson, I think, to teach all of us. And this is literally what stopped Jesus Christ right in his tracks. He had pure, living faith. He heard about Jesus healing the blind man. He didn't see it. He didn't feel it. And when Jesus Christ walked by, he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. I didn't see you do it, but I believe you will do it because I've heard you do it. And I'm going to rest my faith on the foundation of of what the Word of God says. So, the faith life, if you want to stop Jesus in his tracks, you got to know what the faith life is. It's a life here of needing. It's a life here 
of hearing. But, but thirdly, listen to this, it's a life of persisting. The faith life. It's a life of persisting. Now, now I want you to notice this. Notice in this story, this is really kind of comical. Notice who you have standing around him. Everyday, average, ordinary, faithless people that's standing around him. Because the Bible says when he cries out, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, the son of David, notice what they said to him in verse 48. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. Now, you say, what, what does that mean? Let me, let me interpret that for you a little bit better. They're strongly encouraging him to shut up. That, that's what that phrase means when it says many charged him. That, that phrase literally means they're, they're strongly encouraging him to hush up. That's what hold your peace means in the Word of God, to hush up. But you know what he did? I love this. They told him to shut up, and he just cried out the more, didn't he? Now notice what he says in verse 48 again. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, shut up, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. See, he's determined. Listen, they don't know what it feels like to be blind. They don't know what it feels like to be a beggar. He says, I don't care what you tell, were telling me. I'm going to Jesus, man. Persistence. Not listening to the naysayers. But listen, guys, there are certain things that's going to try to hinder you from going to Jesus in your life. For first of all, think about this. There's distractions, right? I mean, these guys right here are, are being a distraction. He's trying to get to Jesus, and they're trying to distract him away from Jesus. Guys, did you all know that the devil is the master of distractor? And that's why when you come to the house of God, if you're not careful, you'll be distracted. you got to be determined. You got to make it up in your mind. You got to say, you know what? I'm not going to watch all these people getting up, in and down, walking out, going to the bathroom all the time. I, I'm not, not going to sit there and focus on that guy that's coughing a lung out. You know, I mean, I'm going to stay focused. I'm going to stay determined. Why? Because the devil's the master distractor. And he will bring things to you when the word of God even is even being preached and, and, and it'll try to get your mind. Not focus on what God's saying. So what you need to say is, man, I'm going to be determined. And, and I'm listen, I'm going to be focused to respond to what the Word of God is saying. Distractions will keep you from Jesus. These guys were being a distraction to him. But I'll tell you something else that will keep you from Jesus. Are you listening to me? Amen? The lives of other people will keep you from Jesus. I said the lives of other people can try to keep you from Jesus. I mean, <laughs> you say, well, well, look at them. Um, man, what are they doing? They're trying to, they're trying to, they're trying to act all holy here, and, and then they're not. See, you say, well, okay, um, Brother Danny, <sighs> look at these people here. They say they're saved, they say they're Christians, they go to your church, but but they failed. Well, well let me just tell you something. If you start looking at other people, you're never going to get saved. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? I mean, listen, the, the devil loves for you to look at the lives of other people. And I'm just telling you, he persisted. Listen, that, that's real faith. I love this. The more they told him to hush up, the more he shouted, Jesus, have mercy on me. Friend, listen to me. Be persistent. Don't get distracted. Don't let the things distract you from doing the life of faith. Man, I, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm a little distracted tonight because, I mean, I've been, I've been kind of focused here the last 24 hours of what's going on in our nation, right? And, and so, I mean, here I am uh, getting ready to prepare to preach to you, and I'm distracted, you know, and, and thinking about a lot of things, what's going on. But you know what? I got to have the faith life. And i got to be able to be focused because you know what? No matter who is President of the United States, Jesus is Lord of all. Amen? Amen. So, hey, let, let me give you a word here. Amen? Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. But we need to trust in the name of the Lord God, right? And so, focus. Don't get distracted. The world might be throwing you curveballs. You might be looking at all these things. You might get distracted here for, for a while. But I'm telling you, man, let's stay focused. I shared with you last Sunday, man, our marching orders do not change, right? 
We're to go out in all the world and preach the gospel. No matter who's in Congress, no matter who's in Senate, no matter who's the president, guys. So, don't get distracted. The faith life. What an example here. The faith life is a life of needing. It's a life of hearing. It's a life here of persisting. But listen, it's also a life of receiving. The faith life is. Now, now follow this. You got a giver and you got a receiver here. You got a giver with the gift, but see, the gift never becomes a gift until it's received. Notice what the Bible says in verse 49. Again, Jesus stood still. Now, now think about this. He had an entourage with him. Verse 46 up there tells us that there were a great number of people with him. I mean, get the picture here. I mean, Jesus was, was surrounded by all these throngs of people, right? And, and they're walking. And over on the side of the road here, there was this old, common, blind Bartimaeus. And, and he cries out and he says, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Hey, hush up, old man. Quit disturbing things. Man, you, you don't need to be disturbing Jesus. He doesn't have time for you. Get, get out of the way. And, oh, no. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Persistence. And all of a sudden here, the entourage stopped because the person at the center of it stopped. And the Bible says that he commanded him to be called. And I want you to look here how squirrely and fickle the crowd is. It says that, that in verse 49, it says, Then those guys rushed to the man. Oh, Mr. Blind Man, oh, be of good comfort. Notice, rise up. He, he calls you. That guy probably, blind guy probably said, Man, you're the same crowd that told me to shut up. Get out of the way, man. I'm going to Jesus. But, but notice here, we have a giver, but then we have... A receiver. Notice in verse 50 what he says. And he casting away his garment rose and came to Jesus. Now what does that mean? That, that literally is talking about the outer cloak that he was wearing. He, he couldn't run in it. He couldn't move fast. And, and so when you've been blind all your life and you're going to see, you got to get everything out of the way. And by the way, for you to get saved, that's the way you got to get saved. See, you got to surrender everything. You, there's some stuff in your life you got to cast off if you're going to see Jesus. And as a believer, there's some stuff, some garments, some filthy garments that you got to get rid of, man, if you're really going to have the faith life that's really hindering you from, the, from seeing Jesus. The very thing that you won't let go of, the very thing that you won't get rid of is the thing that's actually hindering you from really experiencing a pure relationship with the Lord. Cast those things off. And so the Bible tells us here, it says the next thing is, is that man is standing there at the Lord Jesus, and Jesus asked him a question. You see, guys, I think that Jesus Christ is more anxious to bless than we are sometimes to be blessed. He, he said in verse 51, Jesus answered and said unto him, What? Wilt thou that I should do unto thee? In other words, what do you want me to do for you? Now, now guys, listen. You, you know what he said here? He, he didn't say, because Jesus said, what would you have me do for you? He didn't say, Lord, give me a million dollars. He, he didn't say, Lord, give me early retirement. No, he, he knows what his greatest need is. He, he says in verse 51, Lord, now, that's the key right there, right? Master, ruler, boss, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And in verse 52, Jesus says, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Now, notice this. And immediately he received his sight. Immediately he went from death to life. Immediately he went from being blind to being able to see. Uh, immediately he went from darkness to being in light. And the Bible does not say that he saw, then he believed. The Bible says that he believed, and then he saw. And that is the way that faith really works. And that right there, my friend, is what stops Jesus in his tracks. Wow, what a wonderful picture 
that we have here. I mean, here's this blind, beaten down, begging man, sitting by the side of the road, and the Son of God, the Lord of the universe, is stopped in his tracks by this man who cries out in faith. And I'm telling you, folks, that the same Jesus then is the same Jesus right now. And again, he's walking up and down these aisles. He's going in between all these chairs. And I'm telling you, friend, if you will cry out tonight with a pure heart of humble faith, Christ will stop in his tracks. And you know what he'll do? He'll turn to you and he'll say, What can I do for you? Stopping Jesus in his tracks. You see, Christian, you're all defeated tonight. Listen, you know what Jesus is saying to you? What can I do for you? See, faith has the boldness to ask, but it also has the boldness to receive. And, and maybe there's somebody here tonight, I don't know. Man, you've, you've never truly been saved. You have no peace. You have no joy. Well, what do you got to do? You got to be willing to cast off some of them garments you got to be willing to let go of some of that sin that you're holding on to that's actually keeping you from Jesus. you, you got to be willing to, to come to the place where you say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. <clears throat> and you know what he'll do? He'll say, what can I do for you? Stopping Jesus in his tracks. The faith life, guys, what is it? It's a life of needing. Remember, your need is your nudge. Never look as a need as your enemy. Change your perspective on the needs that you've got. Understand that your need is just an area that God has brought in your life to draw you closer to the Lord. That burden that you think is such a burden, that need that you've been, you've been so burdened about, maybe the Lord's using that to nudge you closer to Him and to the, and to the relationship that you have with the Lord. Oh my goodness, guys, it's a life of hearing. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Listen, it's a life of persisting, guys. Don't get distracted. Don't let the world distract you. Don't let the devil distract you. Don't let the lives of other people distract you. Don't let anything that the devil tries to put in your way that's not of God to distract you from being persistent and focused on doing what God's called you to do, no matter what happens in this world. Be persistent. And friend, it's a life of receiving. Man, you've got to be willing to understand that there comes a time in your life that you've got to be willing to let go. And you know what? He's the giver. He's ready for you to take it. You've got to receive it. And you've got to act on what He says to do. And I'm telling you, if you have that kind of life of faith, He'll say, what do you want me to do? I believe there's Jesus. that Jesus is here tonight. And He's saying to somebody, what will you have me do? Man, the answer is easy. The life of faith. Let's bow our heads and let's just close our eyes right now as we have this time of invitation. As the Holy Spirit of God has spoken to your heart tonight through the power of the Word of God. The truth has been delivered to you tonight. Friend, listen. Do you honestly have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you if you're a member of the church. I'm asking you, do you honestly, personally have a living relationship with Jesus? Do you know that you know that you know if you die tonight that you're going to go to heaven? Well, friend, listen. You've got to come to that place where you say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Repentance. If your desire tonight is to be saved, man, we want to encourage you right where you are if you would just cry out to Him right where you are and just simply say this prayer. Just say this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight recognizing that I am a sinner, recognizing that you are the Lord God, and I'm asking you, dear Lord, to have mercy, mercy on my soul tonight. I know you died for me on a cross. I know you were raised from the dead. And I know, dear God, that you are alive. Have mercy upon me. Save my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Just say that. Amen.
Listen, if you look at me, if you said that prayer and you honestly meant it, I want you to know that you have been born again. Jesus is now the Lord of your life. And we encourage you tonight to come forward as we have this invitation. Maybe you just need to come to the altar tonight because you got a big need. you got a need that's overwhelming you. you got a need that you feel this, this pressure and this, this, this burden that you think is so heavy, and it's a need. But maybe the Lord is calling you tonight to come to this altar and to just do what God has called you to do.